recording, right? Yeah, it's recording. Great. So let's begin. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tammy. I'll be moderating our presentation and uh, discussion today. Um, allow me to introduce Richard, Richard Hardiman. Um, he, Richard completed his uh, PhD in environmental chemistry in 86 at the Hebrew University, Jerusalem, uh, following which he worked and lived for 30 years in China. Uh, and I have a note here that he worked and lived in all provinces, including Tibet, on, uh, wow. different, <laughs> on different environmental projects. Um, during Richard's recent research into the environmental aspects uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, for which he published a recent chapter um, in a book uh, that was published by Springer in, uh, in 2019, he noted the importance of China's banking policies in the financial uh, um, aspects of the BRI. And uh, this led him to the current focus of his research into the greenness of Chinese banks, which we, we will uh, delve into today. So his talk today will uh, attempt to explore some of these aspects and to draw some conclusions as to how green are the Chinese banks. Richard, please. Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen and go into uh, PowerPoint mode. So, um, I guess everyone can see that, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so as uh, as Tammy mentioned. Um, Basically, this is it. I, I was writing this chapter in the book on environmental considerations of the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And, um, and, and what came out of that is, is this, uh, this fact that about 86% of the funding was coming out from Chinese corporates and financial institutions. So, so then I started to, to look at where that funding was going. And, and what came out was this picture here, which if you look at the, uh, the, the, the yellow uh, and the blue, the yellow is the state-owned enterprises and the blue is private. And it was the, the state-owned enterprises who were financing uh, coal power projects. Uh, coal, gas, oil, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, fossil fuel projects, whereas the private sector was financing primarily the uh, renewables. So then I sort of said, well, what's going on here? I mean, here's China signed the, uh, the Paris Climate Change Agreement in 2013, uh, and, and, and here they are funding these uh, coal power projects. So, um, so I, uh, in the process of, of running my course, um, I got my students actually to delve into it to look at the, the policies of the, uh, of the banks. And, um, and, and I have to say they came out with some uh, very interesting results and I give a lot of credit for that. Not only that, but, but Jonathan, actually undertook and he decided to take on the subject of green green bonds in China, uh, which was an excellent paper. And uh, anything I mention on green bonds is basically coming out of, um, of, um, of, of Donaldson's work. Um, so this is, this is basically how I started digging into um, uh, China and its financial policies, both inside China and outside China, from an environmental perspective. But before we go into that, I mean, I know that we're probably familiar with uh, the normal organogram for the government of China, which has the Politburo, it has the state council, the ministries, the military, and of course the Communist Party. I'd like to take that into a different perspective. And this is really a concept that was developed by, um, I think Mark Wu is his pseudonym, Mark Cohen, who's dealing with IPR in China. 
and, and he called it China Inc. And, and what he meant by that is that China actually doesn't operate as a government, it operates as a corporation. And this is demonstrated in this, this diagram here. For example, if you look at SASAC, um, SASAC is a state-owned asset supervision administration. It controls all the state uh, enterprises, state-owned enterprises. It controls half of the Chinese companies, which are on the 14 Fortune Global 500 list. These include like China Mobile, Sinocom, Dongfeng Motors, Bao Steel, um, the three major telecoms, um, and SASAC, just by pure science, it's as if in the US you have one single agency which controls General Electric, General Motors, Ford, Boeing, US Steel, DuPont, AT&T, Verizon, Honeywell, et cetera, et cetera. So SASAC is literally enormous. Then you have Central Huijin. Central Huijin, it was established in 2003. It, under that umbrella of the financial umbrella of Central Huijin, you have the big four, the big four of the four uh, state banks of China, uh, key insurance companies, securities, etc. all are larger than any American or European or Japanese bank. And, um, and not only that, but because Central Beijing lends money to SASAC, they have shareholdings and they are becoming a major shareholder in, in SASAC. Um, so this also has interest. Uh, it, it has a board of directors, a board of supervisors, and it's all under the, uh, the state council. So I just give the, an example. In the case of the financial crisis in 2008, um, where it's almost as if the US Treasury set up a single government entity to control the shareholding of JP Morgan uh, Chase, Bank of America, Citibank, and Wells Fargo. Central Union had it already. So when NDRC said, we need $4.1 billion. Central Huijin got it, moved it, and pushed it into the enterprises that needed uh, support. Um, and as a result, China managed to, to keep its uh, GDP at about 9% or 10% during 2009 and uh, 2010. And then we, we, we look at the Communist Party. Well, the Communist Party has a major role, a major decision-making role in all these organizations. And I just want to give an example. Um, um, you've got the, the three telecom companies, is Unicom, China Mobile, China Telecom, which are all on the, the stock exchange, they're IPOs. And their shareholders, and overnight, the Communist Party decided to rotate the CEOs of these three telecoms and put them in competing telephone uh, telecom organizations without even informing the CEOs themselves. So, and they did that in, in 2009, and they did it again. So they did that in 2003, and they did it again in 2009 with, um, with the state airlines. So it's basically this reason that I, I call uh, China, uh, China Inc. And I, I think it's an appropriate uh, title. So um, let's, let's look at the banking system per se. And I, I have to say, I don't like these organograms, but to um, but keep it simple, you've got the state council, which oversees the, the banking system. Um, you have the different regulatory um, uh, commissions, which are uh, managing, they're setting the policies for the bank together with the People's Bank of, of China. And 
and then directly linked to the commercial banks. Now here it says the big five, uh, the bank of communications is not so big. So really it's the big four. It means the agricultural bank of China, the bank of China, China construction bank and the industrial commercial bank of China. And then you have these policy development banks, which are really the banks which um, fund overseas investment of which the largest is the China Development Bank, and then the Exim, Export and Import Bank, and the Agricultural Development Bank. So under this framework, you have the policies of the banks. Um, so if we look at China's total assets, they're about $40 trillion. Now you can see in the adjacent table, this is from Wikipedia, it lists the banks. And, and basically the American banks, I mean, it's peanuts. It's only about $2.3 billion in these different banks um, compared to the total assets of China. So enormous amounts of money are, are out there. Under, under the Chinese banking system. So let, let's look at the, uh, the banking policies and, and how they're, they're implemented. Um, you, you would think that green banking was fairly new to China. In fact, um, they were already onto it in, uh, in 1995 when the, uh, the People's Bank of China set guidelines. Of course, guidelines, they, they don't mean obligation. They're, they're guidelines to include environment and in their decision-making. Um, the real action started coming in 2016. And this is when all the key organizations, it means the, re the banking regulatory commissions, the People's Bank of China, the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Finance got together and they set out guidelines for establishing a green financial system. And in 2019, um, this was even more enhanced also by the, the China Banking Insurance Regulatory Commission and they set instructions how to include environment, social, and governance into banking. So we see you know, China's taking this seriously. It's not just pushing it on one side. Um, and indeed, if we, we look at this, this is a publication that just came out last month um, under the G20 ranking. China sits at the top. It gets 10 out of 10 for its research and its advocacy. And if you look at its overall grade, it has a grade of C compared to some other banks, which only had a grade, grade of F. And many of those sitting in, uh, in European countries uh, as well. So um, at least from a policy perspective and from an advocacy perspective, uh, they are, uh, they're doing pretty well. The question is uh, implementation. Um, what are the different uh, financial instruments which are, are taking place? And um, so I'm just checking the um, time. And here you can see the, these different instruments. They give loans for solar power, for energy efficiency, wastewater management, reforestation. You have the international credit lines with the uh, World Bank, the IFC, the Asian Development Bank, and KFW, et cetera, um, and different credit schemes. So um, th th there's a whole set of financial uh, instruments which are being used. I, I won't take them one by one, but I'd like to, to look at um, the green bonds. And again, um, under the green bonds, I'd like to uh, give credit here for uh, to Jonathan for this uh, um, particular aspect. Um, so actually, 
Green bonds was an idea. It was an idea which was initiated by the European Investment Bank uh, to mitigate climate change. So the entire focus of green bonds was on climate change. And this was in 2007, a year later, the World Bank took this up and they put out uh, 390 million in green bonds. This is what it looks like today, or at least how it looked like two years ago. Um, you can see here that there's been an exponential increase in the interest of green bonds. Um, and what we can see with, with the corresponding lines or the dots and lines here that much of the investment actually took place just in the last two years or in 2019. Uh, and it now sits at 1,000 times larger than uh, what it was, um, let's say, 10 years ago. So um, the tremendous interest in, in green bonds. So why, why green bond? What, what is, uh, what, what's the interesting aspect of green bonds? First of all, green bonds are controlled. They're in accord with financial regulations. It means that they can be trusted. Um, secondly, they're much more transparent than regular investment in that you need detailed reporting on investments. What projects are being used or to what projects are green bonds being, uh, being applied to? And you have an independent body which supervises this. So it's not just a bank reporting on itself, but it's an external body reporting on it. And this gives a lot of credibility to green bonds. Um, the SNP has, uh, has given it a AAA status. And, um, and, and uh, why should somebody issue green bonds or why should someone buy green bonds? Because it increases the, the profile, the green profile of, of the company itself. Um, um, and because there's, as we saw from the chart before, there's a generating interest in green, more and more people investing in green bonds, so green bonds are increasing their capital value. So you can actually um, win on, on, on that as well. Um, it, this better value is its um, volatility. It means normally a more risky investment will give you a higher return. But in the case of green bonds, actually the risk is quite low, but it gives you quite high returns. In fact, the yield on green bonds is something like 4%. So, um, Basically, uh, green bonds are a, a, a win-win situation. The big question is, what is green? And it should be said at this point that there's no agreed international standard of what constitutes green. The original concept of green bonds was that they are used to mitigate climate change. So the Climate Bonds Initiative, they had a stop-go system, either you're green or you're not. Did it. Um, another organization called Cicero, they have different shades of green and they will quantify a project to how green it is. Um, and the um, s &P, has a grade of about one to 100. So the basic calculation of greenness is um, what is the carbon emissions per unit output? For example, if you have a hybrid car, what are the emissions of that car per kilometer? And therefore, how it is classified as being green. One of the big question marks here is, is hydropower dams because the climate 
Bond's initiative, it's still very ambivalent about whether it would consider hands as a potential for uh, use of green bonds. The fact is that dams, they, you have uh, um, eviction of people from the land, uh, they cause downstream steam erosion of water, such as we see in the Mekong, for example. It occupies uh, prime agricultural land, and there are many dam issues. So even though dams are, or hydropower is the renewable energy, um, uh, it's not so sure whether it is green, at least under some of the criteria of the, uh, the Climate Bonds Initiative. So China's green bonds are slightly different. And, um, and, I, and I think really it, it comes down to how you identify what a green bond is. Um, in the international framework is for climate change uh, mitigation. But in China, it's dealing with their own homeborn problems, and that is uh, pollution mitigation. It's this cleanup campaign which, which China has to undertake. And therefore, it has a different set of standards. Whereas in the international framework, you have different organizations which are dealing with their um, classification of green bonds, supervision of green bonds. China, with its overall structure, said, OK, here we have a catalog of projects which can be financed under green bonds. That's the first thing. And, and secondly, um, they allocate what are what is green and what is not green. And this is one of the problems that some of the things they consider green is, let's say, from an international interpretation, not green. From a Chinese interpretation, it's green in as much that it is reducing the pollution in, in China. Um, so in China, it includes things like hydropower. It includes retrofitting coal power plants. It means that you have, um, I'll get onto that later, cheap and nasty coal power plants and to make them more environmentally friendly by putting um, uh, sulfur uh, flues on the chimneys or having more efficient um, turbines and so on that is classified for green bonds. So um, anything which increases the efficiency. So if we look at what they're investing in, 26% is going on, uh, on energy um, and 27% and, uh, goes on urban trains and metros, that means to reduce the congestion of traffic in, in, in cities. Um, and the remainder is on energy efficiencies and uh, prevention of pollution, ecological com uh, conservation, and, and so on. However, when CBI, the Climate Change, uh, Climate Bond Initiative, did an analysis of China's uh, green bonds, they said only 56% meet their criteria. And, and one of the examples, and this is an example that, that Jonathan gave, is this um, this chemical plant in Shanxi. This, this chemical plant was producing 2.2 um, million tons of sulfur-rich coal, half a million tons of methanol, gasoline, secondary products, liquid, liquefied petroleum gases, etc. sulfuric acid, ammonium sulfide. But it passed for uh, use of green bonds because the chemical plant was more efficient and less carbon emitting than the traditional plants. So this was a key. The only trouble with, with, with green bonds is that they are um, they, they're not, people are not investing in things like restoration of the environment, restoration of, of land, of soils, of forestation, People don't invest in that. Energy transport is fine, but 
the things which China really needs uh, is not, green bonds are not being used for this. The other interesting aspect is that it's, um, it's not top down in as much that um, it's the central bank which is issuing the green bonds, not at all. It's the provinces and the prefectures and the counties. And you can see here how there's increasing interest in the, the provinces and in the, the, uh, and in the prefectures, the counties less so. But um, it means that the local provinces or the local prefectures are saying, we want to install some environmentally friendly uh, projects and we want green bonds for that. And so they, they issue the, the green bonds. So this is the overall scenario in, in China. And I, I think it's a reasonable one. I think it's an interesting one. It shows that they're demonstrating an intention to, to make the environment better in China. When we come to the international situation, it's slightly different. And, and before I get into the details, I, I want to just enlighten you to how much does the world actually owe China. Um, and, and we know that China has been giving these massive uh, loans to different countries. And, and basically, if we look at it's an estimate, this is the estimate, about $5 trillion or about 6% of the global GDP. Having said that, we have very, very little data. China doesn't report on overseas loans. Um, and 50% of the loans to developing countries goes under unreported. So we're talking about big estimates of major concern is that if you take 50 of the major developing countries, the debt owed to China um, is uh, increased um, from 2005 to 2017 to about 15% of their national GDP. That's, that's significant. Um, and take 12 of these countries, and the debt that they owe to China is 20% of their GDP. Not only that, but China has an arrangement of small commodity agreements. It means that um, you can buy from us, we can buy from you uh, using local RMB, a commodity exchange, a kind of barter change thing. So I would say that this estimate here of 5 trillion is actually uh, modest. And, um, and the real figure may be much, much more. The bottom line is that there's a very large debt to the rest of the world. Um, the question is, to the title of the seminar, to what extent is this, um, this green? So China's been very conscientious about that. It has promised, Mr. Xi Jinping has promised to have a green belt and road. Um, 21 banks have signed to the, uh, the equator principle, which is a framework for managing environmental or social risk in projects. Um, they, it's an agreement not to provide finance or loans which do not comply with the equator pr principles. So um, 21 of the Chinese banks signed this. China, of course, signed the Paris Climate Change Agreement 2013. And in 2016, the 19 Chinese companies in energy transport manufacturing, and they launched an initiative for corporate environmental responsibility and fulfillment to build a green belt and road. In 2019, you had the green investment principles. And this was um, the principle signed by the big four, the big four major banks. And also you had the Green Finance Committee, which was uh, a society for finance and banking in the city of London. And it was signed by 
27 financial institutions, including the big four, the Chinese, China Development Bank and Exim, and in it had seven key investment principles. So basically, China has uh, agreed to be very environmentally conscious in its investments overseas. One of the catches on this is that in the Belt and Road Initiative, the statement is that it agrees to comply by the laws of the country in which it invests. Of course, many of the developing countries do not have these types of laws which indicate that you cannot invest in such and such a project. And, and therefore, um, if that's the case, then there's no prohibit uh, prohibition of, of China investing in that. So when we look at overseas investment, um, I'm particularly referring to this um, right chart here. The, the situation doesn't look quite so good. Um, we have tremendous investment in coal compared to renewables. This is the green line is the China policy banks. It means the China Development Bank, Exim Bank, of course, other banks, Silk Road Fund. And these are the China commercial banks, the, the big four state banks. So what we can see here, that investment is not so good. Um, having said that, it doesn't mean that there is no investment in renewables. Uh, and that is increasing as time goes by. So um, again, what we see is that there, there is some um, potential there for not investing in fossil fuels. Um, this chart here generates or it shows how much is being invested by year 2016, 17, 18, 19 by the different banks in coal power. And again, the situation does not look good. Of course, you have uh, non-Chinese banks down here, which is also not so good, but much, much less than what China is investing in. Um, this is some of the uh, map of some of the, the uh, coal power plants that China is actually financing. And um, I think to have them won 2016, about 240 plants in, uh, in 68 countries. So, yeah. Serious stuff. The question is why? Why does China want to invest in coal? And this is actually something I've been trying to figure out. And I want to give here a couple of examples. First of all, um, in Tajikistan, there's a power plant called Dushanbe 2. Dushanbe is the capital. And it's 80% funded by the Exim Bank. Now, this um, power plant, it, it had a lot of complaints from the public. Um, the government insisted on going on with it. It was actually done um, in exchange for a loan. They, they, they built the plant and the loan said, you don't have to pay interest on the loan just give us two gold mines. And while you're paying back the loan, we'll take the, uh, we'll exploit the gold mines. And then you can have the gold mines back. Um, and there was some suggestion on this power plant that actually the materials used were second hand. It was never proven, but then we go to Cambodia in the special economic zone, Dianuk. And what it turned out was that this power plant that was built there was actually using a decommissioned power plant from Hunan called the Chang'e Chang'an power plant. And the company that was doing it is called China Northwest. And if you go to their website, what they say is the project is a practical measure to implement the overall national overcapacity 
and a response to the National Belt and Road Strategy. It will be transferred from trash to treasure. So, what's going on here? Um, and if we look at China, its energy industry, we bear in mind about 60%, maybe 65% of energy in China, which is in the order of uh, total energy is closing in on 20 gigawatt. Bear in mind that Israel is just 22 gigawatt. So energy and coal is 7% of China's GDP, mainly run by the state-owned enterprises. Just recently, it was about nine months ago, a year ago, um, Datang Group filed for that uh, bankruptcy. And this was, it set shudders in the entire um, community of the energy utilities industry. What we have to remember is if you go back um, 20, 30 years, China was building about one power station a week. These were cheap, nasty, inefficient, and polluting. And they took vast loans to deal with this. And they have to pay back these loans. Today, because of pressure, first of all, environmental regulations, is causing them to close down or restrict their use. Plus, the price of coal has gone up 30%. Um, plus, um, <clears throat> quotas which are given to the renewable energy that the coal power plants in China are operating at about 40% of their capacity and um, about 50% of these coal power plants are losing money. So when Datong, Datong filed for ban bankruptcy, the Financial Stability and Development Commission said, we have zero toler tolerance for this malicious behavior. And they said, get the money back or by crook, so that's an in English term, but it means basically we need our money back. So what I can see from this is that the problem facing the coal industry inside China is being handled by compensation of loans and construction outside of China and in the use of, of secondhand power plants. The problem here is that what we see today is that renewable energy is becoming increasingly less expensive. And what we can see here is that by 2026, um, let's say wind energy and even solar energy will meet the same price as, as coal. Having said that, this chart says ultra supercritical coal, which is a very efficient coal mine, uh, uh, sorry, uh, coal power plant, and not a normal one, which is much more cheaper to, to run. Um, but still, it indicates that renewables are starting to take over. What it means is, that fossil fuel investment, fossil fuel coal power plants are going to be stranded assets. They are becoming stranded as assets inside China and by passing the buck internationally, they are becoming stranded or they will become stranded assets outside of China. 
So basically, many of these developing countries will be holding the can. So I'm, I'm going to draw to a conclusion now, but basically, what do we conclude? First of all, China signed the climate change agreement. China has a policy to become carbon neutral by 2060. What we see is that China's banking policies, they are green, but to some extent, under that first diagram I showed of China Inc., it's the state that dictates how these funds are going to be used. So inside of China, the main objective is to use green, green finance to reduce pollution. It's not to mitigate climate change, change which is the objective of um, funding outside of China. But what is happening now, and I think we're in the, 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 the middle of this uh, ongoing situation, that China is becoming increasingly meeting confrontation with its overseas investment, particularly in democratic states. Maybe Tajikistan is not a problem, but I'll, I'll run over a few examples. Bangladesh has capped its uh, coal. It says we're not going higher than five gigawatt, and it cancelled 23 gigawatt of fossil fuel plants. Pakistan also cancelled 1.3 gigawatt of coal projects. Vietnam cancelled seven power projects and it suspended another six. In Kenya, there was an interesting case of um, the construction of a power plant in Lamu, which was a World Heritage Site. And it was going to be the largest power plant in the whole of Southern Africa. And the NGOs or CSOs, they took it to court and the court caused the plant to be canceled. These are all financed by Chinese banks. So what it's saying here is that China can no longer do what it wants, at least in the democratic or semi-democratic countries. And it's being forced to become green. And I think this is what we're seeing, if you look at some of the chart I showed some time back, um, it shows that in 2018, there's a dramatic increase in the number of renewable energy projects. Um, and this is not to say the least, we all know about the, the, the debt trap which many of the developing countries are, are facing. So um, this is my, my conclusion. Um, I think overall just keep, um, keep our finger on the pulse and um, watch this space. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, this was very, very interesting uh, to me personally, and I'm sure to uh, our, our fellow uh, seminar participants. Um, it, this is a subject that I've never uh, actually listened to a talk to or actually read about. So it's, it's always very, very interesting to hear different aspects of um, about, to me at least, about China's uh, economic development and and its relation to the um, objectives also that it has in the international arena. Um, I wanted to maybe before we turn to Q&A and if, if anyone has any question, just maybe uh, raise your hand in the, let's see if we have it here. Do we have it here? Reaction, yeah. Either raise your hand or just jump in because we don't have so many participants that it will turn into a chaos. So whichever uh, is more comfortable to you. But before we turn to the q and I wanted to ask um, a few questions. First, just to make sure that I understand the framework because uh, to kind of like set the stage, I guess, I wanna make sure that I understand the purpose of these green bonds. Um, so basically, 
you said that the international community view it as a climate change mitigation strategy. Um, and, and what I'm struggling to understand kind of like the basic of the mechanism is what is, what is the rationale uh, of how it functions? I mean, how do we from capital allocation move to environmental protection um, and in China, how do they expect that this will reduce pollution? What's the mechanism? Is it we only finance projects that are going to promote um, uh, either reduce pollution or uh, do some other form of climate change mitigation? Is that kind of like the rationale of, of the green bonds initiative in general? So just kind of like if you could set the stage, the rationale that stands behind such financing platform. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, that leads me to a question about um, the relationship between the central government and the different local governments. If you could talk a little bit about how the dynamics there influence, because you, you inferred to that when you said that uh, at the provincial level, uh, we see that most of the projects are taking it, uh, uh, or at least most of the financing is directed by the provincial level. So I'm, I'm curious to know if the provincial level is the one, let's say, promoting those projects, are they implemented at the end of the day at the different local levels, at the prefectures, at the counties, and so on, um, so that even if the initiative itself does not come from the local, the lower local level, but comes from the provincial level, what does it say to us about how the central government is actually able to implement its policies down the stream? If, if this is something that somehow comes into discussion in your project. Um, I'll, I'll finish okay. with that right now. I have many more questions, but we'll get to okay. that after, yeah. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's begin on, on green bonds. And, um, and Jonathan, you're willing to, uh, you're, you're welcome to interact if you want. Um, so th first of all, there are green bonds. There are also blue, blue bonds as an example. Uh, blue bonds actually deal with the ocean, uh, coastal uh, areas which are becoming problematic, polluted, and so on and so forth. So um, I think the, the, the concept of green bonds as opposed to bonds per se, I mean, bonds also have a value, but green bonds give you a guarantee that this money is going to be used for a green project which is said was for climate mitigation. And, and that, um, that gives a tremendous amount of uh, assurance to first of all, the people who, uh, who issue the bonds because they want to be, be green. And secondly, um, it ensures that uh, the project which is gonna consume these bonds will comply. And as I laid out in the, the presentation, it's an external supervision, there's regular reporting and so on. So you have an all round guarantee. Not only that, but um, as I indicated, you know, you get quite a good yield from them. The, the price of the bond is going up at the moment because so many people are interested in having bonds. And, um, and, and so the, the, the guarantees are all around it. In the case of China per se, Yes, they have green bonds. I would actually give it a different name. I would call it a, a, um, a pollution mitigation bond. Um, but um, what is interesting is that it was not, it's not this top down situation. It's saying that at a provincial level, for example, and what we saw was that most of the bonds were being issued at the provincial level. So at the provincial level, um, uh, they're saying, okay, we want in our project some green products, uh, 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 green projects. I mean, that green project could be a hydroelectric dam or it could be having a metro system, um, if electric car system or something. And so we need funding for that. So they set up the green bonds and invite people to, um, to invest in those green bonds. And then they will use it for these different projects. 
So it's a means and a way to filter, let's say, general investment, which could, you know, general investment could go for, for anything, chemical plants and power stations or whatever. It allows to focus on, in this case, um, pollution mitigating uh, um, pro projects. Yeah. Is, is that, yeah. Jonathan, if you've got any other points, please, please let me know. Um, I think also the transparency of green bonds is much larger than the usual bonds. And it's break the asymmetry in the financial instruments to give much more um, knowledge to the buyers of the bonds on how exactly uh, does it make. And this itself uh, reduce the risk of not uh, um, being able to do the project eventually. So a lot of green project, especially in China, is not really uh, can be um, financial. Kashali um, Banglit and financial. Very. Uh, you can go with Hebrew and we'll, okay. yeah. Thank <laughs> you. There are a lot of projects that are very difficult to do, but it's not only difficult. And in the case of the government in 2015, they said that they had to get a lot of money from the government. And in the end, it's a lot of ואז מצד אחד הוא מאפשר משהו מאוד מאוד ייחודי לפרויקטים גם, שהוא מגדיל את הסיכוי שלהם לא רק לגייס את הכסף, אלא גם להצליח בפרויקט לבסוף לאורך השנים הללו, שזה משהו שהרבה פעמים לאו דווקא הוא מובן מאליו בכאלה סוג של פרויקטים. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you the privilege, you're the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, no, I, basically, um, what, what John was saying is that, you know, it's, it's, as I said, these bonds are, are very certain, very transparent, much more transparent than other bonds, and um, a lot of the pension funds are investing in green bonds um, because of this transparency, because of this certainty, and so there's a lot of interest in it. And um, they allow for projects which may have had difficulty in accessing uh, financing um, to access financing because they qualify for, for green bonds. I see. So, but, but basically the provincial government issues the bonds and calls for whichever contractor or, or just a company that wants to establish a dam, as you said, and, and those providers, those uh, companies that actually perform the project can come throughout, they, they can come from uh, the various um, prefectures and cities and it doesn't have to be a provincial level contractor. Is that correct? Well, as I mentioned, um, the, the central government actually has a catalog of, province, of projects and, and therefore it has to be on that list of, on the catalog. It reminds me of, in, I'm going back some 20 years, but they had uh, the Agenda 21, which was the idea of um, financing projects which were environmentally friendly. And at that time, there was a, a big book of projects. China simply came up with these are the projects which we want to be financed under Agenda 21. I believe this is the same type of aspect which, um, uh, which is in the case of the Green Bonds. So they have to be on the list. Thank you. Anyone uh, want to pitch in with any question? If not, I'll continue, but you know, go ahead and please. If you have any questions, please feel free. Okay, so let me uh, then raise a few more things that I, I found really, really interesting and would be curious to hear about your opinion, about Jonathan's opinion or anyone else that, that's 
is that is present here and wants to pitch in. So what, what I found very interesting is that it seems that um, the problem of, of using green bonds in ways that basically promote a very specific criteria that, uh, that the government uh, defined uh, while while not addressing, as you said, or maybe even operating to the contrary of other criteria of uh, environmental protection that the government did not specifically enumerated, right? So like you, you mentioned, uh, there was no projects about de deforestation. And um, so it seems like there is an adherence to what they are giving as a measurable criteria and in an ignorance of the other aspects of environmental protection. And this, it seems to me that it is something that is uh, very much characteristics um, for other aspects of governance in China. And we see that in a whole bunch of other examples, right? We see that in the, um, the criteria for the cadre evaluations, right? So they're given specific GDP criteria, let's say, um, and, but they're not given um, maybe, uh, well, in recent years, they, are, they, are, they have been given criteria for accelerating production efficiency and so on, but we saw the problems of maybe the previous decade where they received a generalized kind of criteria of one sort, and then local officials, local cadres did not know how to implement or, or maybe did not want to implement it in ways that, uh, that they saw contrary to their own interest. And I was just wondering if, if this is something that you also see in this specific area of the bonds. Okay, yeah. Um, personally, I don't think it's a blindness on the part of the, uh, the government of China. Um, or, or an ignorance for that. I mean, they, they have massive problems of, for instance, soil contamination. Um, uh, deforestation is less so, let's say, afforestation, they can still work on that. Um, I think the, the main point is that um, these types of projects are not economically viable. It doesn't, it's simply not worth, you know, the decontaminating uh, polluted land with heavy metal metals or copper or cadmium or lead and so on and so forth. Um, economically, it's not viable. And this is a big, big problem that China has. I mean, when you've got, um, I think the figure was 20% of agricultural arable land was, um, was, was uh, polluted, then to, to try to rectify that would cost a fortune. But, um, Green bonds is, uh, it, it's, it's not economically viable. So nobody is going to set up a project for that. It has to come from other sources. I think this is the, uh, the, the issue. Um, the the um, an example that um, um, green bonds can be used for, uh, let's say organic agriculture, which is actually not on the list of the uh, international climate mitigation type green bonds. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's a question of economic viability. It's not really a question of, of blindness. Thank you. Okay. Um, what's that? I can continue. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of points here that are interesting to me and I'm, I'm yeah. happy to just yeah. go ahead and ask yeah. them. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so um, I saw that uh, in, in your presentation that uh, uh, the data set, at least at the, at the first part of the presentation, where you show the, um, the divide between state-owned enterprises investments in coal and uh, the private sector investments uh, in renewable energy. And uh, around 2016, there was a form of a, a very interesting shift in how the state is involved in the economy. And um, there was not really a, a shift, but more of an addition of various forms of involvement in the economy as a, as a financier, whereby the state does not only, um, does not only purchase 
or 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 does not, the state is not is not only a controlling shareholder in state owned or state controlled enterprises and in uh, many forms of listed firms, but it is also invested in uh, private firms as a product of the mixed ownership uh, initiative that they had. So they encourage the state to invest a kind of like a, a private equity investment vehicle. And they called it um, government industrial uh, guidance funds where, and, and I saw that you talked about Central Huijin and it's kind of, I guess, related, but it's, it's, a, it's a shift in their state of mind where you invest minority shares in private enterprises. And they specifically, in the recent uh, policies, they specifically aim for those investments to be directed at certain industries that they have categorized under their um, um, five-year plan approved recently um, to be those specific industries where they prioritize investments, right? So we have the AI and we have, I don't know, uh, polar and sea exploration. And among all those things, we also have obviously environmental sustainability and specifically with the with uh, respect to te uh, technological developments in the environmental sustainability arena. And so I'm wondering if you see any if you foresee any changes in that kind of like public private divide that you showed us as an outcome of this shift in approach where the state is invested as a minority investor in private companies. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. In my, let's say, observation and opinion is that there is a growing shift. One in as much that the Communist Party per se perceived itself, you know, in the old days, the Communist Party was, let's say, a pain in the neck. They were a nuisance. They always put the brakes on. They always stopped things happening. They always got in the way, you know, and, and so on. But what Mr. Xi Jinping has done, he's starting weeding out the old and bringing in the new. The number of Communist Party members is being reduced, but the quality is increasing you know, graduates, educated, and so on. And, <clears throat> and um, in consequence, in, in consequence, the, the Communist Party per se is becoming more and more like a business. And I think the private enterprises, and I'm kind of turning your question around the other, the private enterprise are quite keen to have a government investment. And as we know, there's no, and uh, it's not that clear distinction between private and, uh, and government in, in, in China, because at some point or other, most people in the private had been at one time a government official, at least in the, the old days. So there, to have the government investing in their company, or even having the government on board in their company, is an advantage, because they know it. it's an advantage in making connections in, in terms of the Guanxi and the whole... Um, culture of China is, is that type of scenario. So, um, so yeah, I, I think there's the private uh, sector is very interested in having government investing and, and government participation in their companies. And I think the government is also basic because the private sector has been shown to be at least three times more productive than the, uh, than the government sector. So this would also maybe say that the overall investments in renewable energy, like we might see a shift in the composition, I guess, of state and private investments in renewable versus coal, perhaps in the future. I don't know. It might, yeah. it might have an, an, an impact. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let me see if anyone has any thoughts or comments or questions. Okay, then um, maybe I'll ask a final question. And with that, we, we will conclude. Um, okay, so one aspect of your project, the last aspect, basically, I, it, to my understanding, the way that I understood it, um, shows us that while China had committed 
to have a shift to environmental sustainability internally, carbon neutrality by 2016, you mentioned, uh, 60, sorry, you mentioned, and so on. Um, its aspirations and it, its commitment seems to apply perhaps, arguably, but seems to apply domestically only while inter internationally, it, it basically gives a more free hand to its SOEs and um, state controlled banks to keep polluting and do whatever it wants, right? If, if, you wanna, if you wanna put it into this populistic kind of framework, but basically it, it kind of engages with the entire discourse of how China is impacting and how it is, um, how it, complies with international expectations with respect to its place in the world. And so um, maybe there is um, something that you can tell us about that in, in that respect. And I also was wondering if the Paris Accord, uh, just in terms of its, 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 its force on the international regime, if it applies on what countries can do only within their borders of, or if it also applies on what countries do outside their borders. Um, so just like if you can tell us a little bit about the international perspective. So, so, so first of all, on the, um, the Paris Climate Change Agreement, uh, that agreement is specifically where, where China has made a statement and it said that I believe it will reduce its carbon, it, it devised a ratio, and that ratio is carbon emissions per GDP which is a very interesting ratio. I think it's the first time this has ever been a def definition in, in terms of, of climate change. Basically, they said, um, we will reduce our ratio of carbon emissions per GDP um, <clears throat> by 25% of what it was in 2005. So it basically it was to, completely internal. And uh, they'd obviously done their homework, their calculations. Uh, since 2005, their GDP has shot up so many times. I think it went up five times. And their carbon emissions, because of shift from heavy industry to light industry to high tech, uh, has only gone up two and a half times. So they've met their commitment. That's OK. It's nothing to do with what happened outside of, uh, outside of China. Um, and the, the first aspect regarding China's, um, obviously, it wants to resolve its internal problems, which is causing uh, public dissent, um, demonstrations, etc., both air pollution, water pollution, and uh, all other scenarios. Um, and I think social stability is the, the, the key to any policy which China issues. Um, so it's very concerned about the public. Um, but outside of China, it's a different situation. Outside of China, what we see is that it is facing a confrontation. And this confrontation is from um, countries which are starting to say, OK, we don't need your money and we don't need your loans and we don't need your projects. And we don't need your uh, your pollution. So there seems to be a, a substantial resistance there um, for accepting this. this. is a different type of pressure. I suppose you could say it's the same pressure. Inside of China, it's, it's social pressure against the government. Outside of China, it's um, international pressure. Um, the, the bottom line is that that China has to, and I believe it's in the process of changing its tune. Um, what I mean by changing its tune is, as I, I think, if you, you might have noticed that in, in, um, in 2018, there was a dramatic increase in the number of renewable energy projects under the Belt and Road Initiative. And, um, and I, I think we're gonna see that in the future. So basically, you know, China is coming to realize that it can't just do what it wants in the, in the globe. It, it has to listen to, to others and hopefully this will, will come out. Hmm. Great, thank you, Richard. We have a raised hand by Yuri, please. Go ahead.
Can you hear me now? Because the connection, uh, I'm in Beijing and uh, the okay. Zoom is not working very well. Can, okay. can you hear me? Okay. Um, I just uh, want to add a little bit as, as a small footnote to your presentation, which is very enlightening for me. Uh, I think that China is also learning the um, impossibility to, dis to dissociate uh, internal and external problems in the environmental protection. And I, am I, I witnessed it uh, in the last three weeks in Beijing. We had two awful sandstorms from Mongolia uh, and um, the discussion started with, okay, uh, you know, many, many people are usually blaming the sandstorms on Chinese government. And this time it was not Chinese government, it was Mongolia. But Mongolia, uh, as Chinese media was very quick to point out, uh, is very violently developing itself, its mines and uh, destroying its environment, which now uh, China has a price to pay. And I think that Chinese are starting to realize that it is actually their investment in Mongolian economy and in Mongolian mines, which suddenly uh, causes sandstorms in China. And uh, gradually it will take time, but uh, environment doesn't have borders. Just like the pandemics doesn't have borders. You need to find a solution which will be universal solution and uh, which not be just exporting your polluting industries to everybody like Western countries did to China 30, 20, 25 years ago. So sooner or later, and I hope very much sooner, uh, not only because of the international pressure, but also because of this new understanding of the interconnectedness of environments that uh, China will have to consider external environment maybe less, but still not much less than it is considering now domestic one. Okay. I uh, so sincerely hope that that is also translated to the forests. Um, there are major problems of deforestation as a result of uh, illegal logging in Western Africa, apart from the, the Amazon, which is the uh, expansion of soybean production for uh, for, for meat consumption. Um, so, yeah, if, if that can be translated to the forest, then I think uh, the world would be a better place. Okay, so if we have... I'm sure no, that sooner or later it will. Go ahead. <laughs> no, okay. <Yeah. laughs> okay, let's yeah. hope that sooner rather than later. And if we have no further uh, questions or comment, comments for Richard or for Jonathan, we will uh, meet in our next seminar. Thank you very much, Richard. And thanks everyone who joined us today. Thank Great you very time. much, Richard. It was fascinating. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you.